Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live TV Peer Exchange. This program features expert panel discussions reviewing the latest advances in the treatment of first-line metastatic pancreatic cancer with a particular focus on case study scenarios. My name is Johanna Bendel, and I am Director, GI Oncology Research and Associate Director, Drug Development Unit at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute and Tennessee Oncology. Participating today on our distinguished panel, I'm so pleased to have these folks here with me today, are Dr. Francis P. Arena, MD, Director of NYU Langone Hematologist Oncologist, Arena Oncology Associates, um, Gabriella Kiorian, MD, Associate Professor of Medicine, University of Washington, and Associate Member, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Ramesh Ramanathan, MD, Medical Director, Virginia G. Piper Cancer Center, Scottsdale Healthcare. Thank you again for joining us and let's get started. So here's what's really interesting. I don't know about the rest of you, but remember when we started and it was just gemcitabine? Gemcitabine alone, we didn't have a lot to offer patients, probably five FU in the second line. And all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, we now have multiple regimens that are available for our patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer. And I'm willing to bet you a cold cup of coffee, how's that, that um, we're going to start to see some improvements in survival that are going to come along with the use of these newer regimens. And so what I thought we could do today is talk a little bit about these different regimens, what's the data behind them, and then how do you choose what you're going to use for your patients? So let's start off with Fulfirinox. Now, Ramesh, when I first saw the Fulfirinox data come through, it was a randomized phase two study years ago at ASCO. And I remember walking by with one of our colleagues saying, are they crazy? And then, lo and behold, a few years later, we had this randomized phase three data. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I think certainly the results came, were very surprising. Um, generally, in pancreatic cancer, people were very hesitant to use combination regimens, and Fulfirinox is a combination of three drugs or four if you add leucovorin in. Um, I think the initial study, um, we were all pleasantly surprised that it was fairly well tolerated and the response rates, I think for the first time we saw response rates of more than 30% in metastatic pancreatic cancer. And then the phase three study was presented and published in the New England Journal two years ago. And uh, it had a remarkable survival of 11.5 months compared to 6.7 for gemcitabine alone. And uh, all parameters were improved, uh, response rate, progression-free survival, and also quality of life. Uh, there was really not much detriment uh, with chemotherapy in both arms. So overall, um, even though it's a small study, I think uh, something we have to take into note and uh, try and use it in daily practice. Yeah. I think one of the issues is uh, this was a study done in selected centers in one country, in France. Uh, we really don't have experience in the U.S. with this regimen, and I think that's one of the reasons we have multiple variations or modifications of Fulfirinox. Um, but I think uh, it's certainly one option for our patients while we wait for more data. Right. So, Francis, tell me about this regimen. Why were so people so freaked out about it? It sounds scary, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a lot of medicines for a group of patients that are usually fairly sick. And I think anyone that's used uh, oxaliplatinum, for example, in colon cancer, has a, you know, a good feel about the drug and the sense that it is a powerful medicine. And combining it with CPT-11, irinotecan, and then putting this in this combination, especially when you take a look at most pancreatic patients. The age is about 70 years old. And often, um, their quality of life from the beginning is not very good. So to think that we're going to use this really intense regimen, two major player drugs that we're going to add to this, you become a little squeamish. And I think what Ramesh said, it was that we were pleasantly surprised that lo and behold, we started to see responses that we did not previously even think was going to happen. Exactly. So have you used it in your practice? We did, and we have. And um, the question is, where do you put it? Just like all new medicines and all new regimens, where does it fit in the litany of things? Uh, as we practice medicine today. And I think maybe we go back, at least in my mind, to the questions of how we got started. And if we go back to the late 90s, 1996 or 7, when Van Hoff and colleagues went ahead and looked at gemcitabine alone compared to 5-fluorouracil, 
the reason why we use gemcitabine as the gold standard was not because of its response rate necessarily, but because it made patients feel better, their quality of life issues improved. And I think that was a start. I mean, we all got the dear doctor letters and said, hey guys, this is what works, but we're not saying because of response or how long a person lived, but patients felt better, their pain got better, they ate more, their weight gain again. This was a very important step, totally unfounded in the sense of how we were using this as a guidepost, but it was a very important first step. And now we're starting to make a little bit more headway, we're chipping away, and now we're starting to find response rates. And perhaps, um, I, I know in my practice, we're trying to look at who should we start on this or should we start on that, depending on a whole host of parameters. Cost could be one. It could be quality of life when they start out with. What is, what is their performance status? Very good. I think good. that's important. Excellent. And Gabi, Ramesh alluded to dose modifications. And so I think a lot of us here potentially dose modify fulfirinox when we first use it. How do you treat people with fulfirinox? Um, I'm sure that we all have our things at work that we've tested in our patients. Um, I would say the number one thing that I personally uh, modify is I take away the 5-FU bolus just because we think that that could be the culprit in causing a lot of the acute GI toxicity, a lot of the acute nausea and vomiting. So that's one one way we modify it. And of course, we look at the, the overall health of the patient. If somebody has you know, diabetes, of course, I would actually also potentially even dose reduce your oxaliplatin. Uh, for a patient that already have ongoing problematic diarrhea, for whatever reasons, I may dose reduce the arenotic. And again, these dose reductions may be 20%, but they don't happen in every patient. The bolus 5-FU, I would say, I eliminate from the outset for all of them. But uh, depending again on each indivi individual patient, I may consider adjusting the oxalic platin or the arenotecan in addition to the taking away the 5-FU bolus. You know, we've done that. I've had patients that have come in, they've had recent biliary stents placed, and maybe the first cycle they'll get something like a modified Folfox, and then we add in the arenotecan. But certainly, I think the bolus dropping um, has been done almost across the board. How about growth factors? Are you using prophylactic growth factors? So I guess uh, this is uh, definitely a must in, in our institution. Our institutional standards is for if the neutrophils uh, at the beginning of, of the regimen are less or equal with 4,000, so within normal range but still less or equal with 4,000, we, we automatically institute growth factor support. I would say yes, if I've already treated someone with um, pegulated GCSF, and the next time around then they come and the neutrophils are 10,000, I may, I may hold it that time, but I really want to make sure that those neutrophils are up there uh, and without giving the, the growth factor support. And have you seen people change their performance status with full Fearnox? So, uh, yes, for the better and for the worse. Yes. <laughs> it can go both ways, and I think that that's why Something that only practice uh, changes us because obviously medicine is not math. Well, again, and every patient is different. We do institute a lot of extra supportive care, uh, including hydration as needed, sometimes uh, twice a week. Uh, a lot of, again, little things that can make a difference on how patients feel. And I think that's how our scare of the Fofinox diminished because now we know that supportive care can make such a big difference. Very good, very good.